Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the Community Projects Feedback Session with Evgenia. Um, Biofeedback and Art Placement Gallery with their team, Levi and Melody, together through the Community Project, would like to thank Sask Arts for their funding support of this project. Um, before we start, um, well, I'll just let you know we are recording as you just saw. Um, feel free um, to keep your cameras on or off, whatever you feel comfortable with and communicate through your audio or through the chat box below. <clears throat> My name is Emily and here we have Lauren and Kelsey and together we make up the Biofeedback Collective. Uh, we reside and practice here on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And as a collective, we are focused on creating relational and feedback-based programming for underrepresented and emerging artists. We explore how we relate to one another, our bodies, the places in which we inhabit, and how our own unique histories and testimonies come together. Today, we wish to acknowledge the land on which we meet, Treaty 6 territory, home to numerous First Nations, including the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dene, Dakota, and Métis Nation. Biofeedback recognizes the current and long history of colonialism in Canada and our own positionality in different places and spaces within this context. As non-Indigenous people, we are committed to learning and holding space for the personal testimonies of those who have, are, and will share their knowledge and stories with us. We hope, we hope to explore both the vibrant successes alongside the difficult histories of Indigenous and settler people and lands, and together, we hope to uphold these values, histories, and testimonies within our practice and our everyday interactions. We would like to express lots of gratitude today for you, um, for you for attending and engaging with the community project and this feedback session. Um, so before we get into the feedback session, we just wanted to provide a little bit more info on the community project and about what a feedback session is. So the community project was developed to support the community of artists and makers here in Saskatoon and the surrounding area through a series of relational events and workshops. So today we're here for a feedback session and this is kind of like an experimental gathering that's led by an artist. So they, uh, we do encourage some back and forth between the artist and the participants. Um, to help with this, we have a prompt, which is what forms of research are you doing in your practice to stay attuned to the world around you? So Evgenia has asked participants to bring an object to the session that they can show um, and discuss. And this can be any object that relates to your practice that you would feel comfortable sharing. I'm muted. Um, I will quickly introduce Evgenia. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist working in installation, video, drawing, and performance. Her work examines the complexities of perception, communication systems, language, and epistemology through interdisciplinary research-based practice that investigates parallels between the ways we experience the world through our senses and the ways we interpret the knowledge we acquire. So without any further ado, Jenna, thanks for being here. Hi everyone again, and thank you so much for having, uh, for having me. This is wonderful. I'm so glad I was able to um, connect with you and be part of this great initiative. Um, great introduction. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I guess we can just dive in. Um, so as Kelsey said, uh, I'm an interdisciplinary artist and I, I would say fairly recently, I started uh, being more pronounced about uh, the fact that my um, practice is very much research-based. And by that, I mean few different things. And so I wanted to talk to you about um, the potential of research and um, artistic practice and also how it becomes this incredible tool for connecting um, people and non-human communities. And so what I would like to do is perhaps I will talk a little bit about that and I will I'll give you some examples of my work and then we can have a talk back session and 
if you're comfortable sharing um, a little more information about the object that you brought, we can maybe start a conversation there. Um, so I would like to um, share a screen to start kind of like my little introduction. If that's okay with everyone. Are you able to do that or is there a permission? I, I think so. I should be able to. Let's see. Can you see? Yes. Oh, perfect. Great. Wait. Yeah. So, research. What, why, what, when, and how? Um, so, the prompt that I um, thought of asking everyone was, you know, what kind of research do you do? Well, I can start by sharing what kind of research I do and see if that gets us somewhere interesting, hopefully. Um, when I think of research, I really think of it as, um, I really think of it as research. So a way of rethinking, reimagining, um, revealing perhaps, um, various processes that uh, kind of recontextualize our, our search, our, our yearning for connection and, and thus our creative process. So, you know, we're all looking for something, we're all searching for things. Sometimes we look for um, kind of unexpected, sometimes we look for familiar, but essentially we look for a different state, a sort of different perspective um, that brings us to um, share something with others. And this process of search, um, I see it as like an unstable gesture. And this unstable gesture, its choreography um, kind of reveals more about the context that we're in rather than what we're necessarily are looking for. And so it becomes this kind of performance that we're all participating in. Um, so then I think about research, it becomes an investigation into the context of a moment in time prompted by a gesture of connection. And you know, maybe this is more helpful. Like, again, it's just an investigation, an inquiry into context, moment in time. And then it's really kind of ignited by the gesture of connection uh, or like this gesture of connection, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I think this one is really prompted by the gesture of connection. So they really are together in this endeavor. So what happens then? Well, sometimes I also think of it as like a learning a new language. Um, it requires empathy, it requires patience and curiosity. And so this process uh, becomes, um, you know, fascinating, could be inspiring, uh, but also, you know, the findings of it can be challenging or painful even. And so sometimes throughout this process, we have to reconcile with these findings of the research. And we try to think of how to uh, weave them into our practice and into our lives and like where do they sit where do they go you know sometimes they're perhaps they're close in proximity perhaps they're you know being dug underneath and we only look at them once in a while because they're too painful but sometimes they're very much um, in the core of our practice and so it's a very precarious um, process it becomes this kind of performative gesture and yet it's very very um, honest gesture. And so again, I keep thinking of research as recontextualization um, of this kind of yearning for connection, this impulse that ignites us um, in our search. Uh, and it becomes kind of like power engine of our creativity becomes about rethinking and refeeling. And, and so when we're in that moment, when we realize that we're yearning for something, yearning for that connection, and we started to dive deeper into the questions that um, are in our mind, sometimes we uh, kind of finding ways to feel them out with all of our senses. And that process um, requires, interestingly, really requires a few different things. So part of my research uh, in the last few years uh, have been 
in regards to communication. And when I say that, people often think of, you know, perhaps uh, digital communication because we are living in digital communication age. But really, when you dig deeper, communication and language uh, becomes more about uh, meaning making and significance. And so what becomes meaningful is was kind of the main question I've been asking myself. And, and so I started digging into um, semiotics, a study of uh, meaning making and, and significance. And so one of the things that kept popping up through various um, research that I've done is that an attuned attention and embodied experience of our physical world, um, along with empathy, really is what kind of the core elements of um, significance, as we call it, like a, in linguistic, they call it um, a linguistic sign, which could be anything from a word, it could be a concept, it could be an image or sound, anything that brings meaning to us. And, and we sort of embody that meaning within that um, object or process. And so interestingly, the research itself, I found this beautiful correlation because the research as a process that requires empathy and patience and reciprocity, this, this process that um, requires connection to happen, requires that significance um, to, um, to happen, both of those things become really entangled. So really research cannot happen without reciprocal relationship building. And on the other hand, um, connection, like establishing connection needs this reciprocal relationship. And so it becomes like an interesting um, entangled view of what really research is. You know, research could be all kinds of things, but yet it, it really deep down, it's this um, building reciprocal relationship that enables you to connect to the world around you. And that could be done in a few different ways. Um, so we can talk about the methods of research and we can call it all kinds of things. We can call it methods, but really these are, these are kind of prompts. Um, so I think of them as ways of looking at things, you know, looking, hearing, thinking, feeling, you get it, uh, to kind of see them or feel them from a different side and, and kind of figure out what that experience is for you. And these methods are sort of like a map um, each little point of this map uh, creates like an interesting image. So it becomes a map of our practice, really, because again, we keep searching. Our practice becomes this, this search. And so these points of connection of different inquiries creates this image, which is kind of interesting. You know, it could be an image of something we can interpret it in myriad of ways. But what becomes even more fascinating to me is that when you put that in context, um, sort of the time in the world around you, now that becomes to reveal even more complex image, which is again, I find extremely fascinating. Um, so we could keep going with this. And the thing is the ways that we uh, practice and the ways that we conduct research, uh, really it, it, it's this beautiful, terrain that we create, this map um, of connection. And the diversity of this terrain really kind of reminds me of, you know, maybe um, the weather pattern in April in Saskatchewan, you never know. So again, what are the methods? What really are the ways that we can do this? Well, I think of a few. So method one, I think of it, I call it the dandelion. The dandelion, um, if you um, ponder upon a question and find yourself uh, that some of them persist like a dandelion uh, that is stuck in the concrete and you just have to give it space to grow until its tentacles are start to reach out other questions. And there's just no other way than just start the research inquiry. And so the persistence of the dandelion is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking of um, starting my search. Then the next method 
I call it the obstruction. And this one happens if you stumble upon an object, a process, or you know, a question that's in the way of your current path. And it obstructs the view with its sort of, you know, quote, convenient location. Um, and so it's really no way around it. And, and you find yourself that, you know, perhaps you even can't, not only you can't see the path, but maybe you slipped on it and, and fell down and your new, you know, lower to the ground position enables you to see things in a very different way. So again, a very unique way to approach um, a research inquiry. Now, the last method is probably one of the most curious ones, and I call it the deception. And this one is an illusion of lack of question, of lack of um, process. And it's very deceiving because its deceiving position can be you know, very fruitful in revealing the questions kind of um, in hiding, um, but also sometimes, you know, you should just examine that void and um, sort of with all of your senses that may guide you through this process, um, perhaps you can reveal the deceiving inquiry um, that's been camouflaged and hiding on the couch of your complacency. And you can only imagine what kind of like food for thought it stole from you in the meantime. So all three of methods are can be um, can be done uh, all together, can be done one at a time. I find that I usually jump around between them. I certainly find myself in in the situation of of needing the method three once in a while. But, all are, are, are very useful to me, have been. I hope perhaps could be to someone else. So now let's say that we, we found an area of significance. We found something to start our investigation, the process, a question, an object, um, a prompt, a gesture. And how do we approach this? How do we approach this? this beautiful entity? Well, again, I'm going to give you some examples. You don't have to, you don't have to try them. Um, I have, and I'm just sharing that some of them worked really well. Others, not so much could be me, but I found all of them were um, very fruitful in um, kind of approaching an inquiry. So approach one, you can certainly tune into it. And by that, I mean, you can um, hear the sounds it produces and it might sound odd, but perhaps it can reveal a new scale and you'll be able to find a way into musicality that you never thought uh, was possible. So tuning into um, an inquiry of significance is, I found very helpful and very fascinating. Now, approach two is a detailed observation of the question and its habitat. Um, sort of maybe a good idea to sometimes observe the area of significance and uh, see whether it's a good idea to tame it or leave it in the wild. Sometimes the wild processes um, lose their vitality in captivity and uh, they, are best to leave where they are and you'd probably be able to better sustain your artistic practice by diversity without it. Up to you. Approach three is um, devour it, eat it up. And if you find that, you know, perhaps it leaves you sour or bitter about the world or, you know, maybe it's spicy nature can um, heat up the conversation of the context of your next project, or maybe you know, you'll find it really sweet and you want to share it with someone. Um, again, a very much up to you. Um, approach number four is sort of approach number three, the other way around, is you letting be consumed by the inquiry. And you can sort of 
wallow and it's never ending impossibility of an answer. You can sit there for hours and hours and that's okay. And sort of while you're in that space, it could be very fruitful for propositional projects or you know, projects that have um, unique ability to connect you to the present while you're in that moment. Again, helpful at times. Approach number five is the more conventional research approach, um, a field trip. And venturing into the question's natural habitat, um, again, has been proven to be wonderful for observing it from all the sides and all of its habits. But the best part about this one is that you may actually stumble upon another field researcher, which is the best kind. Approach number six, again, we're diving into more conventional research approach, but at the same time, hear me out. Words on paper. Um, you can always find another uh, researcher's work that can spark the conversation. And the thing is, especially when the weather is muck, and we all know a lot of uh, winter days, evenings, mornings with freezing conditions and you know they all can drive the question of inquiry into the hibernation and sometimes it's the mental fog that obscures our questions full potential but all of those times really really great to um, find a moment to um, kind of read the work of others and connect it to the larger community while sweeping through the context of time. Approach number seven, and the last one that I have for you is building community, really. So this one, if you find that the question or the process is too big for you to chew on, on your own, you can simply share it and you know, the delicious path of this inquiry could be a beautiful, unique cooking experience that you can share with others. And that's the beauty of the research. Again, it, it becomes a pathway for connecting you to the larger community. So really, all I want to say is that research becomes this way of connecting to time that we have, time that we um, ponder about in the future, and the community around us, human, otherwise, um, the land that, we, um, that we're on. So that was my kind of idea of what I think of research and what I found helpful in thinking about research and its methods. And so with that in mind, keep those methods um, kind of in the back here, handy, we'll, we'll come back to them. And now I just briefly want to share with you how it worked for me and some of the work I've done in the last few years. And maybe that will be, again, fruitful to kind of spark a conversation later. So a few works. Um, this work is called Small Talk Opera, and I created it in thinking about academic research and material research, both. So this project was a collaboration between me and Saskatoon um, Opera. And I was thinking about ways that small talk becomes this unique social building tool to create potential for deeper connection. And oddly, I was finding connections and juxtapositions to uh, ways that small talk um, communicates with us through nonverbal cues and languages. And the same way that, for example, opera um, creates these um, connections as well. Um, it's more on the emotional connection and nonverbal um, cues. And so I found this very unique correlation and I thought I would like to explore it. And so this, this project became a, 
um, a collaboration between Saskatoon Opera's um, talented singers and me and my bizarre material explorations. And so we, we thought of uh, combining um, the musicality and kind of sensuality of, uh, of opera um, as a language of connection through emotion and music to the idea of small talk as something that will be actually useful to the community rather than a lot of the times it becomes just a stereotype for time wasting. And uh, was filmed in my apartment here in Saskatoon with the help of a friend. And um, I, to this day, I, I'm extremely, extremely thankful that I was able to do it. And, and now I'm looking forward to work with Saskatoon Opera um, more in the future. They're amazing folk. So another project quickly I want to talk to you about is called Ways to Connect and Other Remedies for General Betterness. And this project um, came about as I was pondering on the question of ways of connecting with simple means. So how can we connect to the communities around us um, using very simple, you know, not even tools, essentially just our body and, and perhaps in the digital age, we could use some, um, some help with, um, with online connection. But essentially the project became a black and white um, text, a publication, digital publication and printed publication that was um, posted around a neighborhood and distributed through online means. And one of the things really this research was me walking along the river for hours and hours and hours on end and thinking about the simple gestures that we make to, to connect to um, the world around us. And one of those gestures, I kept thinking about how music has this incredible ability to connect people and you know not only people really. Um, and so I was thinking about creating kind of a workshop uh, performance, a way of, of uh, creating a musical um, gesture that would not require um, any prior knowledge of you know, musical notation or, or ability to play an instrument and would be accessible to everyone, no matter their age or, or background. And so I kept thinking about figuring out a way to, to create this kind of musical exercise. And so I came up with this alternative notation that was very intuitive. And um, I later on uh, heard that a friends of mine with children were performing it. And it was essentially for me to, to realize that, you know, sometimes we need very little um, in terms of be able to connect and be able to like foster that connection. Um, so That's the everyday walk that I was on during the first year of the pandemic, wondering how to connect. And another project, the last two projects I want to talk to you about is our, um, both of those projects, both of those works really extend uh, deep into my practice now and what I'm going to be working on the next um, couple of years in my uh, graduate studies. The first one started as a simple inquiry into why some of the objects around us or processes um, are more significant or seem more significant than, than the others and how um, the communication methods that we choose um, kind of affect our decision-making process in deciding whether one or another is significant to us. And so, which seemed a bit convoluted at first, but really the material exploration in this project brought me to depths of um, academic research in semiotics, which is a study of uh, meaning-making and ecology and um, sound studies. But really all of that, would have meant absolutely nothing if I wasn't um, playing with the materials and really questioning the various gestures that we have when we are either manipulating a material or we um, collecting uh, materials. And so the combination of both 
types of um, research processes that really made this project happen is kind of reaching out to the larger community uh, of interdisciplinary uh, researchers and asking them questions that I, again, had no background in really, but it, the wonderful connections that I created through this process is something that I thought is just, sometimes it's all about asking the question. Sometimes it's about reaching out to that person, whether through email or through meeting them for coffee and, and just seeing what's possible. And uh, sometimes it's about questioning your obsessive um, collection, uh, collections and obsessive um, tendency to collect natural or unnatural objects. So in my case, that was that. Um, and so that project really brought me onto my, my recent uh, BFA thesis exhibition and sort of my ongoing investigation into meaning making. So this work is called uh, Mimeglish, or How to Spot a Meaning When the Sound Stands Still. It was a multimedia installation, and it had um, various components um, that were looking into uh, the way that we um, find significance through language. So the way that we communicate significance, the way that we share it, um, and also um, the way that we um, leave it behind. Um, so looking at uh, archival practices of, of knowledge and, and, and meaning making. And so this project is a sort of culmination of various research methods that, that I've done in the past. And it, I found that sometimes it's really not about one process, but it's, it's again, the relationship building um, with the community and, and sort of having the options to, to ponder about the things, the materials, the questions from all different sides. So having that option uh, to play, to, um, to reach out and to question things on your own and having the time and the patience and curiosity to just give yourself that freedom is what help me to be able to um, create something that in my mind at first seemed quite impossible uh, because of its sort of far reach into various disciplines and, and time needed. And so interestingly, this project um, actually um, really became, uh, we could circle back into our first conversation about um, reciprocity and attuned perception because what I found through the research in, in linguistics and sound studies and, and um, uh, meaning making um, is that the significance that we find is only possible if, again, we have empathy, patience to create this reciprocal relationship with the community around us. And we have an understanding and able to have this embodied experience of the present. Without those two things, without the reciprocity and without the embodied experience, it's really difficult, near impossible to actually create um, this link of significance. And so we go back to that idea of what really research is. And research becomes a gesture of connection um, backed up by um, a relationship building process filled with empathy and, and, um, and uh, reciprocity. So this is just um, various um, images that I was trying to collect to illustrate the kind of different ways that I found um, doing research, whether it was being in the certain location. Sometimes it's about just being attuned to the world around you, but sometimes it's also about questioning your, um, what you're seeing and, and what you're feeling and, and kind of looking into new processes uh, that, for example, for me was uh, bronze casting was a completely new process. This was a couple of years back, but at the time it was something I never thought I would engage in and never thought I'd be interested in. 
again, reaching out to people and finding ways to actually um, connect uh, different paths of research that uh, someone else had and, and mine. And we found that it made sense to actually um, collaborate and create something together in a, in a very different process that neither of us were familiar with. And so with that, um, I would like to, I will probably stop sharing this for now. And with that, I would like to extend this gesture um, to everyone. If you brought an object that you're comfortable sharing um, with us, sort of decision-making behind why and, and how it relates to your practice and also thinking about how do you conduct research and what do you think research can do for you in terms of reaching out to the community and, and connecting us in different ways. And if someone wants to share and introduce themselves and share the object, that would be great. 